Good morning and welcome to Archetype Garden Workshop. My name is Ignacio Ramirez and I'll be your moderator for this morning's session. Now, this is a school and is not a church and neither are we affiliated with a church or religious organization. This school is a non-profit, non-denominational, religious and scientific research organization excuse me, uh, dedicated to proving the existence of Yahweh or Elohim and the operation of his eternal pattern, purpose, and plan operating throughout eternity until this present day. Now this school is the result of a divine panoramic vision and revelation given to Henry Clifford Kinley in the state of Ohio in the year 1931. And we have established grad schools throughout the United States, Canada, and certain other foreign countries. Our type pattern workshop was established February of 2022, 21. Now, in this school, we use and teach by the true and original names and titles for the Father, the Word of Son, and the Holy Spirit, which are contained in the original Hebrew text. The true name for the Heavenly Father is Yahweh. It has been improperly substituted by Lord. The true title for the Word of Son is Elohim. It also been a property substituted by God. And the true name for the Holy Spirit manifested in or out of a physical body is Yahshua. It has been erroneously substituted by Jesus Christ. Lord and God, they are titles and not names. The Apostle Paul filled with the Holy Spirit tells us in 1 Corinthians 8 and 5, that there are Lord's many and God's many. We now know that each Lord must have a name, and each God must have a name also. Elohim is a title, but unlike Lord and God, Elohim is a divine title. This means that Elohim is a title that our Creator chose for Himself. Jesus is a name, but Jesus is an erroneous name. A minor investigation on your part into a good dictionary or encyclopedia would prove that the Hebrew language, the Greek language, nor the Latin language have any characters or letters in the alphabet that would produce a sound made by this letter J. Neither was there a letter J in the English language until some 1400 years after the death of the Messiah. Therefore, such names as Jesus and Jehovah are impossible renderings for the true and original name of our Heavenly Father and His Son. Christ is a title, just like Lord and God. Now Yahweh is pure spirit, and in this state, He's incomprehensible, inscrutable, and indiscernible. He is the ultimate source, substance, limits, and bounds of everything. We have Yahweh symbolized in this pure spirit state on this chart as a cloud. Yahweh is not a cloud. He merely chose a cloud to symbolize himself because a cloud has no particular or descriptive shape and form. We have drawn this cloud all around the edges of this chart to show you that everything on this chart is within the cloud. In like manner, everything in the universe abides within the pure spirit state of Yahweh. Yahweh, knowing that man could not perceive of him in his pure spirit state, took on shape and took on form right within himself as Elohim. This is the Word of Son, a super incorporeal being, that is, having the shape and form of a man, but without flesh and blood. And this shape and form can only be seen in a divine vision and understood in a divine revelation. Later on, the self same spirit manifests himself in a physical body and walked the earth plane as Yahshua the Messiah. The world calls him Jesus Christ. Now there's only one name given unto salvation, and we all must know this name. So the simple yet intelligent question we should ask ourselves is, what was the name of the Savior 
during the time that he walked the earth plain. A further understanding of his name and title could be had by reading the preface of the Holy Name Bible. Also in this school, we teach by the divine pattern of the universe. It is called a divine pattern because it is Yahweh's pattern. After Yahweh led the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, he called Moses on top of Mount Sinai and showed him a tabernacle pattern in a vision. And he instructed Moses to build one exactly like it in the wilderness of Sinai. This pattern consists of a most holy place, a holy place, and a court round about. These three compartments make up the one tabernacle pattern. And we go forth in this school to prove that everything in the universe moves and operates according to the structure and function of the streetfold tabernacle pattern and that absolutely nothing escapes the pattern. Now the ten names of the school are as follows. Number one is to help you find and know Yahweh or Elohim as he really is and as he actually exists. Two, to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity in Yahshua the Messiah. Without the distinction of race, nationality, creed, sex, caste, or color. Third is to investigate the unexplained spirit law, or so-called law of nature, and the powers latent in man. Fourth is to encourage and promote the study of the scriptures, comparative religions, psychology, philosophy, modern, practical, and occult science. Fifth is to extirpate current superstitions, skepticism, and ignorance. Sixth, to learn, know, and understand the operation of Yahweh's eternal purpose through the dispensation and ages. And seventh is to discern and avoid being deceived by Lucifer, the serpent, the devil, or Satan and his demons operating the mystery of iniquity on earth through the dispensation of time. And eighth is to earnestly contend for the common salvation of faith that was once delivered unto the sons or children of Yahweh. And ninth is to make known that Yahweh from the beginning ordained there is no other name given among men whereby man must be saved, saving the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And tenth is to inherit eternal life now in the kingdom of Yahshua the Messiah with the hope of a mortal glorification in the New York State. Our watcher is peace and our slogan, speak the truth. This morning we have prayer by Dr. Joseph Isles. Our scripture lesson is 1 John, 3rd chapter, a scripture reader read Dr. Nanette Ramirez. And we have a selection of music after the prayer.
revised by the late A.B. Trina, the Scripture Research Association. I'll be reading the third chapter of 1 John. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of Yahweh. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew, not, knew him not. Beloved, now are we the children of Yahweh, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, 
for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the adversary, for the adversary sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Yahweh was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the adversary. Whosoever is born of Yahweh doth not practice sin, for he his seed doth not for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of Yahweh. In this the children of Yahweh are manifest and the children of the adversary. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of Yahweh, neither he that loveth his, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, <clears throat> And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the Savior's love, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whosoever hath this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shedeth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of Yahweh in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and shall assure our hearts before him. For it, if our heart condemn us, Yahweh is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward Yahweh. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Yahshua the Messiah, and love one another as he gave us commandment. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. I have read 1 John, the third chapter. Let us all say, Hallelujah. All right, thank you for that. Uh, uh, we're glad that uh, you could be with us. Those are out there face, Facebook and YouTube land. Thank you for tuning in. And those visitors, too, that are visiting and listening, also thank you. And if you want, later on we'll have an address up there that you can send your comments or any questions that you have of what you heard. All righty. Uh, our first speaker this morning will be the Ramirez. Good morning, everyone. Sorry about this morning. I have TMJ, and it was really acting up. Good morning, class, again. Good morning. Um, it is always an honor and a privilege to stand before the Assembly of Yahshua Messiah to give a um, testimony or lecture 
from the things that I have learned and he had well he has shown me. Um, let's go ahead and start with. I'll start with the, the tabernacle pattern, but I'd like to use that one because <clears throat> he's going to move it out of the way. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this. Um, the tabernacle pattern is threefold. It has three compartments. It has a court roundabout, a holy place, and a most holy place. Now, the court roundabout, um, it's called the court roundabout because it's the court area that goes all around the t well, all around the inner parts of the tabernacle, but it's it's an open area. Um, so. The first step from the tabernacle pattern, there are seven steps. So the first step is the gate. The second step is a brazen altar of sin sacrifice. The third step is the brazen water laver. The fourth step is um, the first compartmental veil or the door with the holy anointing oil being poured over the priest at the door. And that's the fourth step. The fifth step is the entire holy place, which contains a, a, a seven-branch candlestick, table of showbread, and an altar of incense. The sixth step is the second compartmental veil, which is this one. Um, the seventh step is the most holy place right. that contains the... Ark of the Covenant, which is the three, oh, I can't explain it, the three compart, the th a three part um, configuration. It, it has the, the chest, um, which is the mercy seat, that has the two archangels that are on top of the mercy seat looking towards the cloud, which where this is um, Yahweh's throne. Um, and they're both facing that. And that's the seventh step. Also within these compartments, um, the furnishings in the court roundabout, they're all brass. The holy place, they're all gold. And the most holy place as well, they're all gold. Now how this correlates to, um, let's see to the migratory um, pattern is we can correlate by using um, the steps, the seven steps, also um, death, burial, and resurrection, and blood, water, and spirit. Can we get, um, I think it's first John five and seven or five and eight, where it says um, that these are the witnesses in the, in the King James Version. Okay, so 1 John 5 and start at 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And okay. there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Okay, so when she first read um, that there are three that bear record in heaven, which is the Father, the Word, or the Holy Spirit, um, maybe we should bring up the name chart again. Oh, right here. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we have the Father, which we know is Yahweh. We have the Word or Son, is Elohim, which is a title that our Creator Yahweh chose for Himself. It's a divine title. 
um, we have the Holy Spirit, which is Yahshua. Three, these three are a unity, are one. Um, this is Yahweh's title that he chose for himself, and this is the manifestation of, of, of Yahweh. So we can go back to um, also here, where Elohim, Yahweh is pure spirit. Elohim, I mean, Yahweh transmuted himself in part as Elohim. And then, can we get the scripture where it says, um, the, the word was made flesh? John. John. I think it's John. John. Now, when we read these scriptures, especially, um, I'm sorry, when we read the first five books of Moses, um, where it talks about um, the creation of the world. So, Yahweh, um, in, from pure spirit, transmuted himself into Elohim, in part. And um, when Moses was in the mount, um, he transfigured into the tabernacle, and, and I'm sorry, the, the days of creation. So we have to remember that this is Moses' vision that we're reading when we read um, the first five books. But let's continue with um, John. You want John? Yes. Okay, uh, we start at 13. Let's see. Who was born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of Yahweh. And the word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Okay, so right there it says the Word. So we know the Word as Elohim. This is um, Yahweh from pure spirit manifest, I mean, transmuted into Elohim. Right. And then the Word, or the Word, was made flesh. So um, we can go ahead and um, see that it was a manifestation of Elohim in a physical body, flesh and blood, which is Yahshua the Messiah. And um, we can go ahead also, and I wanted to get to this plate here, where, um, let's see, Yahshua is made flesh, which is, the unity, the, this is the play I really wanted to get to, but um, we already read over, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. Um, so that, that's all I wanted to say was that this is a unity. Um, Yahweh, Elohim, and Yahshua are a unity. They're all one. Um, Yahweh being pure spirit, transmuted into Elohim, which is, um, you can, you can see him in visions and revelations and manifested in a physical body, which is blood and spirit, I mean, blood and water. Um, and that's, that's all I'd like to say. Let us all say hallelujah. Hallelujah. hallelujah.
you know, for what I could probably get into here. Uh, and she focused on, uh, well, let's start with this. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Let's start with that. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Mm -hmm. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is Yahweh a unity. Uh, Yahweh our Elohim is Yahweh a unity. Right, see. I see the first speaker went through that, see. <clears throat> Yahweh, who is pure spirit. Pure spirit. See, abstract, incomprehensible, inscrutable. See. No way you could perceive him at all. Dr. Kennedy had a very nice pithy statement about this. He said that the human mind cannot conceive what it cannot perceive. Since you cannot perceive this pure spirit state of existence, then there is nothing you can conceive about it. <laughs> right. Not anything at all. Right. See? Therefore, it behooved Yahweh to step down from this pure spirit state in part, right. not in totality, see, to become this great heavenly anthropomorphic being known as Elohim. That's a divine title that, that Yahweh chose for himself. These attributes in part coming together to make this organized state didn't take all of Yahweh for this to happen, just in part. And this is the, and then Yahweh pure spirit went out of business. This is the word or son, and this is the creation of the universe right here. Right. Right. Okay? As was said, this word became flesh and dwelt among us. Alright. Maybe we could get a little more to that. Get we read we read first John. Get first John, first chapter. Right. And read that. Just to add a little bit on to that and then we'll We'll push on first this John, something. first chapter. Mm -hmm. That which was from the beginning, mm -hmm. which we have heard. Which we have heard, go ahead. Which we have seen we, with our eyes. This is John, right? He was an apostle. He said, which we have seen mm -hmm. with our eyes. We saw this yes. with our eyes. Read. Which we have looked upon. Which we've looked upon. And our hands have handled. And our hands have handled this. Read. Of the word of life. Of the word of life. The word made flesh. They said, John, he's an apostle. He, he said, we looked upon this. We handled this. Right. See? He was like any other, came down like any other. If, if you and I would have saw it, we wouldn't have thought no more about it. They said, all right, right. this guy? <laughs> oh, man, come on. You got to be kidding. But this was the word made flesh. Now, let me just expand that for a minute. See, because Yahweh, pure spirit here, is the source and substance of everything. This is incorporeal, this is physical. You have two manifestations of one spirit. Right, right. Okay? And that constitutes the universe. Here. We have beginning. That would be like that shape and form. Here we have the angelic creation. That was created first. Here we have a dotted line. Now we have a physical creation. The angelic and the physical creation are co-joined. There is a symbiotic relationship between the physical creation and the angelic creation. See, you, the man, you are body, soul, Spirit. Your physical body is spirit materialized. And you have nine systems. Ten actually, but I'll get to that. You have nine systems that reflect the nine attributes. In other words, they are the nine attributes in part right. materialized in the flesh. Your soul is incorporeal. It's just like the angels. The only difference is you're a constant of physical body, and they are not. But your soul, in part, not in totality, is made up of the same nine attributes here. Okay? And then in here, you have a spirit. See? 
Your spirit is what controls the soul and the body. In fact, I'll go as far as to say this. Your body and your soul emanate from the spirit that is in the midst of you. See? Okay? This is to show you how much Yahweh is permeating the entire material creation. Well, really both the, 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 the physical and the angelic creation. They are the two manifested witnesses of Yahweh. Okay? Now, where would I like to go with this? The first speaker went through the tabernacle pattern. And see, this is, let's read that. Hebrews 8 and 1. Let me get this in there. Because, see, why do we study this tabernacle pattern? There's a reason why we study this. Hebrews 8 and 1. Uh -huh. Now of the things which we have spoken of this is the Son. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the ma majesty in the heavens, mm -hmm. a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which Yahweh pitched and not man. All right. This is the tabernacle. And look, when I point to Elohim, this is the tabernacle that Yahweh pitched and not man. Right. And this is also the, the creation, the universe. The angelic and the physical creation. This is the tabernacle that Yahweh pitched and not man. Right. See, jump down to verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Okay, see, this is a pattern of heavenly things. That's why Moses was told to make this. It's a pattern of heavenly things. If you want to know something about heaven or heavenly things, then I would consult this pattern. Right. Because what Moses made here was a replica of the great heavenly pattern that he saw up here in the vision which is the same pattern that created this universe. Okay? Now, here's Yahweh, pure spirit. Here we got these lips here, and he's speaking. Now, when Moses goes up here, see, the only way we even know about what happened in the book of Genesis, for example, was Moses went up here and he received a vision. See, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, came about because of a vision that Yahweh showed Moses. Right. Moses made three trips up into this mount. Two of those trips, he was shown a panoramic vision. Then he saw the recapitulation of it, which included the transgression and the 63 generations of the flesh coming all the way down to Yahshua the Messiah. Okay, but the first five books, Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Moses wrote that. Even the ones, you know, because people say, well, how did Moses write about his death? Yahweh showed it to him. <laughs> if Yahweh showed him his birth, because Yahweh showed him, you know, in a vision, his parents courting each other. And his birth. Now, if Yahweh showed him his birth, don't you think he would be declared to him from the beginning and right. show him his death? See the point I'm making? So Moses wrote that in Deuteronomy. He wrote that because Yahweh showed it to him. Okay? Now, from that, from what Moses wrote, this is what the prophets had to base what they wrote upon, what he wrote. See, anytime a prophet would make any proclamation or anything, the first thing someone would say, okay, well, what did Moses say about it? Well, what are you getting it from? What are you basing this on? Basing it on what Moses wrote in the first five books of the Bible. Okay? The law and the prophets. His job was to come along and fulfill what Moses and the prophet wrote. And the reason why he could fulfill it, 
He was the same one that appeared back here to Moses to institute it. The institute and the fulfiller of one. Okay? Now, I want to get into this basic stuff here. I want to get into the atomic structure of matter. I want to get into the, the 92nd atom. That's what I want to do. The hydrogen atom. Because this is what this is. I'm talking about Elohim. Right. All right. Let's read Exodus 24, 9 and 10. Yeah. Exodus uh, 24, 9 and 10. Uh-huh. I want that number, yeah, that two, that one there, three, and, and, and yeah, two, three, and four. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. Okay, go ahead and read. Then went up Moses and Aaron's native and Abiah, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Mm -hmm. And they saw the Elohim of Israel. Mm -hmm. And there was under his feet, as it were, a pavework of a sapphire stone. Mm -hmm. And as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. Mm -hmm. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw Elohim and did eat and drink. Okay. Now, under his feet was the paved work of a sapphire stone. This paved work is the earth. Okay. How do you know that's the earth? See, I think it's Isaiah 66 and 1. Uh, keep praying. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Wherever you can put them up at. All right. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 66 and 1. Yahweh, thus saith Yahweh, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that thou buildest unto me? And where is my place of rest? Okay, now that's <clears throat> that's the confirmation that uh, that the paved work of a sapphire stone you want Ezekiel? is uh, Ezekiel. What do you have for Ezekiel? Ezekiel 1 and 26. And above the firmament that was over the heads was likeness of a stone, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above and upon it. Okay, good enough. All right. He's standing on the paper of a sapphire stone. All right, now. This part. <clears throat> Here's Elohim. <clears throat> He's standing on the paper of a sacrifice. This is the same as this. Right. All right. This is in the midst of the cloud. See, Elohim, his incorporeal, super incorporeal body. That would represent the proton right. of the hydrogen atom. Right. Right. The paper of the sapphire stone would represent the electron. And see, this is the same as this, and they're both in the, the invisible third part, which is what Yahweh is. Another way to look at it would be this. Here's the angelic creation. That would be the proton. Here's the physical creation. That would be the electron. They both abide in the mist within Yahweh or eternity, which is the third invisible part. All right? Get it? The panoramic vision pamphlet. Do you have it? Yes? No? You, you, I don't know. <laughs> okay, you're looking. All right. <clears throat> I know I have a copy, I think. Oh, good. Um, <clears throat> go to the pamphlet. And uh, I want you to read.
really need it. No, I want the panoramic vision pathway. So I don't know what I said, right? Right. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. I want you to go to page two. No, take that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, start with page one. One. Read the one, two, three. Start with the fourth paragraph. Well, the well, I was in my meditation. Yes, that's it. Okay. Okay, I'm at the Catholic. And page number one, I'm starting the fourth paragraph. Well, in my meditation, I felt myself drifting away into a sleep, which was not sleep. I lost my consciousness of my room, my bed, even my body. Yet I was not unconscious. The sensation of having my mind turn backwards and inward persist until I was no longer in possession of any earthly knowledge. I knew that I existed and that, and that was all. I did not exist in relation to anything I could recognize. All I could recognize was me. This is that part of me which was created in the image and likeness of Elohim. It was to that me that the Creator spoke. He could do nothing with that ecolo Come on, you know this phrase. Egoistical. No, no, you know this phrase. I know. Egotistical. Egotistical, misdirected personality, which had evolved from many misconstrued conception as a, crea as a creature of earthly flesh. All right, hold on for a moment. Now, <clears throat> If you remember in our last few lessons, which has been really concentrated, we were getting into dispensational truth, we were getting into the mystery of iniquity. We got into Nebuchadnezzar's dream here. And in that dream, he also saw the, uh, the kingdoms of the world, he also saw this rock cut out of the mountains without hands, striking its image and shattering it. This is a metaphor for the EMP, or the egotistical, misdirected personality. This is what we were when we came into class. See, I know people say this. We came to class with a carnal mind, a physical body, and a satanic spirit, which is true. However, you were not born into the world that way. Right. Not in this age of grace, but that's another story. I'll get to that. But it is true because as soon as we get here, we are already inundated in the carnal things of life. I was telling some folks the other night in a Zoom class, I was born on a Thursday. As soon as I get into the world, as soon as I take my first breath, okay, let the record be shown this boy was born on a Thursday, which is Thor's day. Automatically, already, as soon as I take my first breath, he doesn't assign some carnal concept to me. He was born on Thor's day. You know, I mean, just... I, I just took my first breath, oh, okay. <laughs> but that's what happens. And then from day one, we assimilated all these concepts to create what we thought me was. Right. I'm going to do me, that kind of thing. And not knowing that the me that we thought was the real was the carnal concepts we created of ourselves. I liken it to Frankenstein's monster. You know, Dr. Frankenstein, he built his monster. He went out to the graveyard and he got different parts from different graves. He got a foot, a leg here, a leg over there, a torso here, an arm here, a head over here, a brain somewhere else. You know, and twin it together, hit the electricity, and oh, it's alive. It's alive. And that's what we thought. That's what we thought. You know, oh, I'm, you know, I'm doing this. I got it going on. That kind of, because we, in our concepts, but then we come here, see, to this class, to this doctrine, which is that rock cut out of the mountains with our hands to shatter the concepts of what we thought we were because Yahweh we can't deal with them. Right. He can't deal with the egotistical, misdirected personality that, that you created how many years of your life you happen to be. That has to be shattered. 
so that Yahweh can deal with that part of you that is created in the image and likeness of him. Okay? See, that's, see all these things that we go through and all these different lessons have a point. They have a meaning. They have a purpose. They're like pieces of a puzzle. You have to put them together to see the bigger, as Clarence Larkin once put it, I, I steal this phrase, to see the great panoramic viewpoint. That simply means to see it in all directions at once. Right. 360 degrees, because that's how Yahweh sees it. See, 360 degrees, and somebody says, oh, I don't understand that. Sure you can. Just draw a circle. <laughs> Just draw a circle. See, that's the best thing you can see from a physical standpoint to understand the eternity of Yahweh. Right? Where am I at? I was in the pamphlet. Uh, yeah, the pamphlet. Um, okay. Um, go to um, the last, well, it's near the last page, I think. Uh, yeah. Page 10, page 10, um, page 10, the, the last paragraph there, start there. Where I saw the master plan? Uh, yes. I saw the master plan as the... No, wait a minute, before you read that, before you read that, let's, 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 I need to bring this in here. I need to bring this in here. Go to page, um, See, Dr. Kennedy, when he received this vision, he, it wasn't like he was standing on the side and he was looking at it. He was really part of it. Right. See, he was telling, he was saying he didn't see the Israelites, you know, march to Mount Sinai. He said he felt the Israelites march to Mount Sinai. He felt that he was part of the universe. Um, I want to. I don't want to read this whole thing because I want to get to a couple of things. But okay, go to page um, uh, four. Go to page four in the pamphlet. Read the third paragraph. Because see, Doctor Kinley was taken out of his body and said that we really couldn't. Yeah, we yeah, couldn't deal with the the egotistical, misdirected personality that he had become over those years, that had to be shattered. And Yahweh had to deal with that part of him created in the image and likeness of Elohim. All right, you there? Do you want where, as, as one, one senses the yeah, that's it. As one senses the approach of a source mm -hmm. of tremendous power. Yeah, okay, the reason why I'm having to read this, because I'm pointing to this. This is what's approaching. See, look, this heart here is the same as this heart on the cloud. Right. Alright? So now this heart is approaching him, but see, as, as Dr. Kinney said, he said the human mind cannot conceive what it cannot perceive. It can't conceive what this is because it's never perceived anything like this before. As, as this is approaching him, read. So all around us became as one gigantic electric charge, and it was flowing through us and emanating from us, mm -hmm. for we were one with it. Mm -hmm. It was universal, and we were a part of the universe. Mm -hmm. We and our surroundings had been uh, remnant with light, but now we began to dim. There was no mm -hmm. need to see. We could sense with a greater clarity as the source of power came nearer, greater and greater it became until we were vibrating with such frequency as to approach insensibility. After all, we were not Yahweh Elohim. It was a provision, provision of his superior wisdom that no man was permitted to see his face. Our surroundings changed from din dimness to darkness and then to blackness of the interstellar space where darkness become an in, in, penetrable, in, in penetrable, internal, internal, solid. Mm -hmm. When 
how. There is no where, when. There is no how in eternity. It was willed, so it, so is it, as if to further reduce himself to our limitations, Yahweh Elham did not present himself as the great source of power. Mm -hmm. We felt him See, to be. Because they couldn't understand it. They couldn't perceive it. It was beyond their perception. Read. Ours were not spirit mind. Mm -hmm. They were but human mind, freed from the physical bodies for the moment, and function, functioning on a spiritual plane. The human mind cannot accept that which it cannot conceive. It conceives only only in comparison with something else it can and has conceived in the past. We had seen men, we were men with limited cap capabilities. Capabilities. And we mm -hmm. knew something of these limitations. Mm -hmm. Thus Yodi Elohim presented himself to us as a man, but with unlimited capacities. Mm -hmm. Great heavenly anthropomorphic being that he is, he was reconciled. Come on. Recognizable? Oh, recognizable as a man. All right. Now, as see, that's the whole point here. They couldn't understand it, so Yahweh Elohim appeared as a man. They had seen men. They understood a man. So they could identify with that, and that was the starting point for their learning, see, so that they could understand what this was. We. He wouldn't have, Dr. Kennedy would not have painted this had he not right. seen this first and then understand, oh, now I understand what this is now. Mm -hmm. Okay? Is there anything else there real quick? The wisdom that he imparted now came as it in words uttered by the figure which had appeared out of the blackness or before the creation of the sun. All right. Good enough. All right. So now here he is here. Here's Elohim appearing. He's coming from, by, and we got these veils here, right. inscrutable, incomprehensible. That's the cloud. He's coming from well, the pure spirit state. He's coming from the pure spirit state of, of inscrutability, incomprehensibility, and now he is comprehensible. Now he is scrutable, because we say this, he can be seen in a divine vision and revelation. See, Yahweh only appeared as a man to him. Now he's scrutable. Now he's comprehensible. See, these attributes, Lining up together, see, taking our shape and form. And that's when you know this, that this and this are one and the same. Talking about this heart and is and it's, and it's immersed in the kingdom. That's the tenth attribute. The kingdom created from the foundation of the world. That's what Matthew here the scripture. See, so that's now, that's, this is the universe right here. Yahweh took on shape and form in part, not in totality. And then Yahweh, pure spirit, went out of business. Okay? Yeah, all right. Uh, that, now this, see, this takes you to this. Because you see here in the plate, the heart here. And if you notice, see, you have these hearts. Out of all, see the days of creation up here. Right. If you notice that, it's the same one. It's not seven of them. It's just one heart being manifested at different times. That's Elohim. See, that's why here, see Elohim here. He's showing himself to Moses, changes into the tabernacle, then back into himself, and then in part, not in totality, into the universe. Okay. All right. Now here's this heart here. And now here we got veils, a division between spirit and matter, all right? And this is Elohim coming down through the veil in part. Didn't take all of Elohim, just in part to create one hydrogen atom. Now go to page 10 in the pamphlet and read, uh, yeah, what we're going to read, yeah, page 10, the last paragraph down there. I saw the master plan as it or originated in the mind of Yahweh Elohim mm -hmm. and span the yet unrecorded history of the universe. Mm -hmm. Then I watched as a first electron was crystallized 
into visible being according to the plan. All right, so now he sees this electron crystallize into being according to the plan. All right, in other words, Elohim coming through the veil, the division between spirit and matter, in part, not in totality, trans, transmuting into, you see, he saw the first electron, the first hydrogen atom. See, the electron, and then the proton, keep reading. Identical with the pattern of the universe. I listen, listen carefully to what he's saying. Identical with the pattern of the universe. What do you mean? The, what is the pattern of the universe? We said his Elohim standing here on the pavework of a sapphire stone. See, this is the proton, this is the electron of the hydrogen atom. This is what El this is what Dr. Kinley is seeing. He's seeing the first hydrogen atom being formed. Okay, keep reading. Then I watched as man, the final creature, came into existence. Electron by electron, mm -hmm. cell by cell, atom by atom. Then I knew all the things were made according to the pattern I had been shown. All right. See, in other words, it's like this. Yahweh Elohim transmuted in part into the first hydrogen atom and then just simply told him, be fruitful and multiply. One became two, two became four, they became different particles, different molecules, and then it came here, coming through the, another veil, the div dividing the first and second heaven, coming here, see, to make a conglomerate, you know, uh, uh, how did I put it? Uh, and a con uh, amalgamated and yeah, an amalgamated conglomeration of a core mass, and out of this mass, and this is a great mass too. Right. The universe, the physical creation was made out of. I'm talking about these galaxies, and and look at these galaxies. Look, like an average galaxy has at least a billion stars in it. Right. All right, and there are billions and billions of galaxies. See, in fact, there are more stars in the, in, in the universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. That should tell you something, see. But, it's, but it started off with one atom, see. It started off with one atom, see. It's no different than you, see. See, that's how you, that's how you came into existence. You didn't know that? See, look. See, you, you came into existence the same way. Here's an ovum, which is an unfertilized egg. Right. All right, and then we got Johnny, got Johnny sperm coming here to fertilize it, but he ain't coming by himself. He's got millions, millions of these. Right. That's surrounded. The, see, in other words, the first one that get there is not necessarily the first one that'll get in. Right. And the reason is because it takes all of these different sperms, millions of them to put pressure on the, on the egg to make it crack, so one of them can get in. See, the first one, you know, like I say, the first one to get there, not necessarily will get in, and the last one to get there, may not necessarily get in. It's just, you know, whoever is, whoever is closest to the first crack that this egg makes, and they're, oh, an opening, oh, I'm going for it. Shoot the gap, you know. All right, but once that happens, once that happens, the sperm comes in and then fertilizes this egg. The tail is broken off, and for a period, it's still considered to be one cell. But now that ovum, because it's fertilized, it's now become a zygote. All right, it's a fertilized egg, and then it has to go through a what is called mitosis, right, which is cell division. And then one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, so forth and so on. And trillions of cells later, here you are. But you started off as one cell, just like the universe started off with one atom. See? Why? Because, the, because this creation is, is progenit is, you know, the progenitor of this creation is one elbow See? That's uh -huh. what Moses said in Genesis, man is surely made in the image and likeness of Elohim. Right? Because he's looking at the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Now, this is how the universe comes about. Now, Dr. Kinley, when he when he uh, when he received the vision, he received it June 6, 1931. Now. And we've gone through this before, but I don't mind going through it again. Mm -hmm. When you talk about the atom, the atom is a modern day thing now, even though the concept of it originated in ancient times. Right. But the guy who, who originated it, he was poo pooed and dismissed. And so for like 2,500 years, the, even the great scientists thought the universe was built and out of something different, ether or whatever, you know, until the 1800s when a chemist, I think his name was John Dalton. He revived the idea of the atom by thinking, you know, well, the gas, the way gas, because he was observing the way gas molecules are. All right? And so then the 19th century was the beginning of, uh, in the age of physics, for the age of discovery for, for these particles. They were trying to search these particles. All right? Now, the first one that did that was J.J. Uh, was Thompson. He discovered in the 19, late 19th century, he discovered the electron. All right? He discovered the electron, and then one of his students, his name was uh, Ernest Rutherford, he discovered the proton and that the idea of the atom had a nucleus. All right? So, so Yahweh was allowing this to happen. All right? And then the neutron, see, that was the most elusive one. The neutron, which is, let me put it to you like this. We, we, we talk about H2O, right? right? We talk about it, which is water. You know, two parts of hydrogen, one part oxygen. And when you talk about atoms, okay, like, uh, uh, this, is, this, this could be a proton, all right? A neutron is just as big as a proton. The only difference is this has a positive charge. This has no charge, but because it has mass, you know, it can, it, has, it can affect something because it has mass and weight, right? Now, an electron compared to these two guys is like, it's like that. It's like a little, you know, but, it, but what it lacks in weight and mass, it has a very powerful negative charge. That's the difference. See, okay? That's why when you look at, say, uh, hydrogen, the uh, hydrogen. See, the hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron, all right? Now, Atom, now, elements have the ability, most of them do have the ability to have variations of themselves. They're called isotopes, all right? An isotope of hydrogen is this element. Deuterium, deuterium, deuterium. And it has one proton and one neutron. See, now, just knowing this right here, see, see, hydrogen has one proton and one electron. So deuterium has one proton and one neutron. That should tell you right there that deuterium is heavier than hydrogen. See the point? And so H2O, we know is regular water, but did you know that deuterium can mix with oxygen and become D2O? There is such a thing, and it's called heavy water. Right. It's not something you want to fall into, because the viscosity is so thick you can't, you can hardly move. Plus, it's poisonous. But this is what they use in atomic reactors. See, because in atomic reactors, where they have radiation fallout, it's the heavy water combined with cadmium rods that slows down. It's, it's how they control the level of the atomic pile. You know, if they want to, if they want to raise the if they want to raise the level of the atomic pile, they'll take away the rods and drain some of the water out. If they want to control, bring the level down, then they'll add the rods in and put more water in to, to absorb more of the radiation because it's heavy water, see? 
Now, but this is an isotope, this is a variation of hydrogen. Now another variation is tritium. Tritium, where tri means three, it means it is one proton and two neutrons. So that should tell you this is heavier than this, which are both heavier than hydrogen. But there are two manifestations of the one element. See? Now tritium, they used to do tritium way back, because the tritium is radioactive. In other words, it glows in the dark. See, so you have two manifestations of the one, the one spirit. Told you, deep, deuterium detail, you can make heavy water. Look, that's just like uh, right here. See, you got, you got hydrogen, that's Yahweh. Here's deuterium, and then here's tritium. Tritium, we say glow in the dark, because Yahshua here is the light of the world. Right. See, the, see the point I'm making? So you got two manifest, just like you have two manifestations of the one spirit that's reflected in the elements with hydrogen. Two manifestations of the one element. And this is, the majority of the universe is made up of this way. I took an astronomy class once and they, and they told me this and, and I'm pretty much, you know, and they're verifying it too because they just opened up that new telescope, the web telescope, you know, which they could see further and stuff like that. See, this is what they told me in astronomy class. They said that they said that ninety percent. They said ninety percent of the universe is hydrogen. Nine percent of the universe is helium, and then one percent is everything else. All right. That should tell you, now if you just take the first part, 99%, that should tell you right there, the universe is a cloud. <laughs> it's a cloud, basically. Sure, then we got the back in the space, but if you used to put all that, it, it's a cloud. And then in the midst of, then somewhere in the midst of this cloud, you have, there's a solar system with nine planets in it, which is like the stretch of a man, a man in the midst of a cloud. <laughs> See? See, Yahweh has many ways of showing who he is. And, you know, the scientists, they see it, but they don't understand right. why it's like that. See, the scientists understand that, <clears throat> look, they understand that the universe is expanding. Right. This is how they know. It's like a balloon. All right, pretend this is a balloon. Mm -hmm. If I blow air into the balloon, there, there are dots on the balloon. If I blow air into the balloon, as the balloon is expanding, the dots on the balloon will, will move away from each other. See, as, as it expands, all right? Now, prior to the 20th century, the smartest scientists, including people like Albert Einstein, thought that the universe was static. In other words, it didn't do anything. You know, it was just always was, always will be here. Didn't realize that it had a beginning or an ending until this was discovered by a scientist. All right, and what it was, he just used a basic formula here that, and that you could do yourself. Anybody could do this experiment, anybody. It's called The Doppler effect. See, that simply means this. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, 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 uh. 
They say, I don't listen to that, but this is a siren. It's a siren. Uh, you're standing here on the corner of the siren, and it's coming your way. It's coming your way. All right. Now, as it's coming your way, the sound of the siren, this is what's happening. The sound, see, the, the, the wavelength of the sounds will be like this. It'll be as it gets closer to you. And the reason why it's going to be like that is because when it's coming towards you and it's compressed, you'll hear a higher frequency. Right. In other words, it'd be like this. When it's coming towards you, the sound would be like, Wee! and then when it passes you by, then the sound would be like, no. Right. And the reason why it does that is because, let's say here you are here, and let's say this car, Right. Once the car passes you by, see, the wavelength when it comes towards you is compressed, but when it passes you by, when it's, you know, when it's leaving you, then the sound is elongated. Right. It stretches out. That's why it's a more longer sound. That's called the Doppler effect. The same, now, this is with sound. The same principle works with light. Because if you ever studied the electromagnetic spectrum, basically the rainbow, mm -hmm. all right, you will find out that the higher frequencies of color tends to be in what we call the ultraviolet or the blue. And the lower frequencies would be toward the red, what we call infrared. This would be the, ultra, the ultraviolet version. This would be the infrared version. See, and it works the same way with light. When they discovered, when they look at the light of, the, of these uh, galaxies as they are receding from each other, they noticed the shift in the spectrum and that the shift went toward the infrared or the long, meaning that it was moving away from each other. That's how they discovered the universe was expanding. And it reminded me, you know, that uh, there, was a, there was a time, maybe some people still believe it, you know, that when people were trying to say, well, Elohim is red. I remember at Nashville, they did that. They had a picture of a red Elohim. You know, because they found this astronomical thing. You know, and I got it on tape somewhere, the, some documentary I, I recorded, where they did a map of the universe and they, they used the Earth as the focal point, and then when they put all these slides together, it looked like a stick figure of a man standing over the earth. With all, but these, you know, but they were combined of all these different galaxies that were put together like that. And so these, so what the, uh, the board of trustees tried to say, well, see, there's a red man up there. Well, see, according to the Doppler effect, if you're saying that LM is red, then see, according to the Doppler effect, he's moving, he's moving away from you. He ain't coming towards you. You know, you'd have been better off saying he was blue. You know, at least you could say he was coming towards you, but you, since you want to insist he's red, you know, then he's, he's moving away from you. <laughs> you know, but these are things that you can, you can do to find out the validity of what Dr. Kennedy is talking about, see. Science does, you know, verify the things that Dr. Kennedy talks about, okay. Now, going back to the particle thing, the last particle that was discovered, well, the main ones, there were, there's been other particles that have been discovered since, I mean, subatomic particles and stuff, but the main one as far as the electron, the proton, and the neutron, that was discovered by a man named James Chadwick in 1932, all right? However, Dr. Kinley had his vision in 1931, right? Mm -hmm. Which means, and we got it right here, neutron, which means he saw the neutron a year before James Chadwick wrote about it. Right, right. But Dr. Kennedy saw it in a vision. See? Okay? And at the same time, about in the same year, a, a, a Belgian priest who was also a scientist. Maybe you can look him up on Wikipedia. I'll put his name up here.
Georges Lemaitre. If you can find him, that'd be nice. Now he, because, because of the aforementioned thing we talked about, the guy who discovered the universe is expanding, he came up with the idea and said, well, if the universe is expanding, you know, outward, and everything's going away from each other, then there would have to be a point, if we would just reverse the movie, everything would have to come from a single point or a singularity from a single point and then come out. If you was to just reverse it, if everything's expanding from each other, turn it around, everything going back, then everything would have to come from one point. That's what he theorized, see? And Dr. Kinley showed it and proved it on this tabernacle. It does come from a single point. And look, the scientists, they could go back to this point of that first molecule, but they can't go beyond it because there's a veil here the division between spirit and matter. So you can't, you can't get up in there without Yahweh's permission. There's no physical device right. that can penetrate that veil without permission. What do you got, my dear? I got Georges Henry Joseph and Werner Lamontre, Belgian Catholic priest, theoretical physicist, mathematician, astronomer, and professor of the physics mm -hmm. at a Catholic university. Uh, Levine, of Levine. He was the first to theorize that the recession of nearby galaxies can be explained by an expanding universe. By an expanding universe. He was saying because the universe expands, then it's got to come from one singularity, right. from one focal point that it has started from. Keep going. Which was observationally confirmed soon afterwards by Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble. See, this is the guy who, who confirmed it. See, people say, oh, there's the Hubble telescope. Well, the Hubble telescope is named after this guy who confirmed that the universe was expanding. Read. He first derived Hubble's law, now called hubble lemaitre law, mm -hmm. by the IAU and published the first estimation of the Hubble constant in 1927, mm -hmm. two years before Hubble's article. Lemaitre also proposed the Big Bang Theory mm -hmm. of the origin of the universe, mm -hmm. calling the hypothesis of the primable, prim, primable ad, atom. The pri primordial. primordial. Primordial, try that. Primordial. <laughs> and later calling it the beginning of the world. The, 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 the primordial. The primordial atom. Right here. Okay? Anything else you want to um, relate? Anything else? Um, in popular culture in 2019, he was the subject of survey questions. Should schools in America teach the creation theory? of Catholic priest Georges Lemaitre as part of their science curriculum. Yeah, you see, that, that was always a thing, because ever since Galileo invented the telescope, <clears throat> there was always been a contention between the church and scientists. Because, look, up to that point, when Galileo uh, uh, invented the telescope, the, the popular belief, as well as the church belief, was that the Earth was the center of the universe and everything else revolved around it, see? And it was uh, Nicholas Copernicus who was the one who uh, postulated the, the heliocentric theory of the, you know, of the universe. That is to say that the sun was the center of a solar system and that the earth and the planets you know, revolved around it. That was heresy right. as far as the Roman Catholic was concerned. And Galileo proved it with his telescope because he, he saw the, 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 the satellites of the planet Jupiter. You know, and he saw them revolving around, he saw the moon, you know, and, and, and he was able to deduce, I said, oh, wait a minute, this, you know, we got this wrong, you know, that the earth moves around, around the sun, not the other way around, see. Okay, so that, and, and this is in the beginning of the modern era that we went through, remember that? We thought about, about the modern era, you know, I'm watching this, I'm, I'm watching the series now, and then with the Borgias. You know, yeah, about Rodrigo Borgia, you know, because I'm getting more into that. He was Alexander VI. We got into that last week, talking about how the, the Roman Catholics 
you know, they divided the world in, world in half between the new world, the new, any new lands discovered on this side of the line will belong to Spain, and any other new lands on this side of the line will be, belong to Portugal. You know, I mean, that's the Pope. And the Pope said, I, I the Pope, the ruler of the world, have decreed this. The, the, you know, they didn't give a damn what the people who lived there had to say about it or anything like that, you know. But anyway, okay, that's good enough with, with George's. All right, and this is an illustration of what George's Lamentary talked about. All right, Let's see if I can get a good. All right, here we go. Here, here's the Big Bang. Here's the primordial atom, right there. Okay, and then Yahweh says, you know, be fruitful and multiply. Bam, one becomes two, two becomes, and then a period of inflation. Yeah, this is good inflation. You're not losing any money in this one. <clears throat> See, um, that is say the, the expansion of the universe. That's what it's talking about. And then all these different particles become matter and elements, so forth and so on, and, and nebulas and gases and galaxies, stars, etc. You know, then we got life. And then this is what the scientists say. The scientists say this: it's got it keeps going. It'll expand until gravity will take hold and pull it back in. What they call the big crunch, see, the, that would say the big crunch, and then gra gravity pulls it back in, and then it goes right back into the singularity, declaring the end from the beginning. Now that's what the scientists say, okay, based on their observations, right? We agree in this respect. The principle remains the same, but the manifestation, see, that changes. This creation started off with Elohim, right. and it has to end with Elohim. The last three plates, 38, 39, 40, yeah. See, see this, is the, if this is the original 92nd atom, for which hydrogen is based on, then it's got to end that way, see. See, it's got to, you know, and see, because he's the one that started this physical creation, and look, it started in fire. See, it started in fire, and it has to end that way. Because when we talk about the universal revelation, what are we really talking about? We're talking about a trend. If everything is translated from spirit, then everything has to be translated back into pure spirit. Put it like that, okay? And see, this is the, if, this, if it starts off this way like this, then it has to end. If it starts with a, a super incorporeal man, then it has to end with a super incorporeal man. Okay? Yeah. All right. What you got over here? Uh, 39, okay, 38, and I need 40. And I want the scripture declaring the end from the beginning. What is that? Isaiah 45, I think. Here at both ends, and it's look, 
This come out of pure spirit, which is a consuming fire. Let's get that straight. He's stepping, he's coming out, this is consuming fire, he's stepping out of that. So now, here, it's no wonder we have to step back into a consuming fire. Because it's where it come out of. The lake of fire, see, see the lake of fire and, consuming, and, and Yahweh pure spirit is the same thing. See, the difference is, what will your state of mind be when you go into this lake of fire? See, will it be a lake of fire for destruction for you? Or will it be a lake of fire like, you know, taking a dip in the pool? Because, see, if you're in Yahshua, see, and he's coming as a consuming fire, then you're a consuming fire too at this universal revelation. And fire can't hurt fire. But if you're full of flesh and concepts and stuff, now, <clears throat> fire can burn flesh. We're looking at principles here. Okay, but the point I'm making is it has to be a translation. Right. This is a translation. Coming over here, renovation of the earth. This is a translation. The new earth state. This is a translation. Let's get uh, 1 Corinthians 15, maybe around 22. See, declaring the end from the beginning. First, you, you have to know what the beginning is first before you can declare the end from the beginning because the end is the same thing as the beginning. Go ahead. 1 Corinthians 15 and 22. Mm -hmm. For as in Adam all die, uh -huh. even so in the Messiah shall all be made alive. Read. But every man in his own order, mm -hmm. the Messiah, the first fruits afterward, mm -hmm. they that are the Messiahs at his coming. The first fruit, go ahead. Then the cometh of the, of the end. The way of turn, just read that again. Then cometh the end. Thank you. Then cometh the end. See, read. Go ahead. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to Yahweh, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule mm -hmm. and all authority and power, for he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. See, now look. See, remember we read about the, the footstool. Right. See, he's standing on a footstool. See, he's got to put all his enemies under his feet. That's it. That's the footstool. Put all his enemies under his feet. Go ahead. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Uh -huh. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, mm -hmm. it is manifest that he is excluded. Now, it is manifest that he's excluded. See, look, we tell you about these, and we went through it too, last several sessions about the dispensations and the ages, and that they're illustrated on the charts. See, here, the sixth dispensation, the revelation of Yahshua the Messiah, that's illustrated right here, all right? The new earth state, seventh dispensation, kingdom and immortality, the new earth state, that's manifested or illustrated right here. This is the fifth age. All right? Now, when it says he is excluded or accepted, see, the fifth age, the, the sixth age is the sixth step of this tabernacle pattern. See? And this is what has to happen. Keep reading. Which did put all things under him. Now, see, he put all things under him, subdued and under, under his subjection. That includes all. We're, here we are in a glorified earth state, but we... See, we have to assemble, be made of this. Look, it's just the same way uh, back here. Back here, they were told to gather around the mountain and Elvin would speak to them. That was the first assembly or the first church. All right, it's no different. And that's the fifth step, the holy place. New Earth State, fifth step, the holy place. An assembly, see? It's the same thing in principle. Go back. That's why we go back and look at these things. The principles of the tabernacle. The migratory pattern. So you can see what's going on here. You have to use the full range of the pattern to understand what's happening with these things. Keep reading. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto that 
him that put all things under him. Now see now, this is the sixth step. He said, now he shall be made subject unto him that put all things under him. That's him going up into, see look, what do you mean? It's just like here on the day of atonement. See, the high priest had to go up here three times and he was subject to what was happening up here. Because he couldn't, he couldn't just go up in here any old way he wanted to. He had to go through procedures. Right. There was three trips. The, uh, let me, I may as well say this as I got it on my mind. See, there were three trips the high priest went up. The first two trips he went up, he went up with linen garments. Right. On the third trip, that's when he changed into the garments of beauty and glory. That is to say, he put on the Midas, the breastplate, the ephod, and then he went here, from here, he went behind the veil. And then went up here, got between the two staves, turned the Ark of the Covenant around. And he's still flicking the blood, turned the Ark of the Covenant around because he can't turn his back on it. Turn it all the way around and then back out this way and then come back this way. See, that is a figure eight. Right. And see, he did that on the third trip. That's when he put on the garments of beauty and glory. And now somebody said, well, how do you know he did it like that? Because I know this. Because Joshua the Messiah, oh, let me, uh, I don't want you to get any more because we're getting cluttered up here, but I'll show it to you here. <laughs> okay, here we go. See, the reason why I know the high priest did it like that, because see here, here's Joshua the Messiah. This is plate 29. This is his baptism and ministry. This is, this is representative or a fulfillment of Moses' first trip into the mount. And, and if you notice, Joshua is in the flesh. He's in the physical body, which is likened to being wearing linen garments. This is plate 30, Miracles and Transfiguration. This is a, a fulfillment of Moses' second trip into the mount. Yahshua, he's in the flesh, but then he transfigured before Peter, James, and John. But again, he's still in the flesh, which is like linen garments. I mean, I know he translated it, but, you know, this was part of his ministry. Then we have plate 31. See, this is Yahshua's death burial, resurrection, and ascension. Here, he started off physical, but then now he's translated. He's now he's a, he's a quickening spirit. In other words, he changed his garments. Get it? The garments of beauty and glory. See? All right? That's how you can show that. See, the, how the, the high priest on his three trips up to the mount, up, I mean, rather, up, up into the uh, most holy place, the first two times was in linen garments. The third time, he's put on the garments of beauty and glory. All right, and, him, and he's going to, and, he, and each time he's making a figure eight. He's making a figure eight. He does it three times. All right, the reason why he does it three times is eight times three is twenty-four. Why? Because the scripture says there's twenty-four elements around the throne of Yahweh. Okay, but for this analogy comparison with plate thirty-nine, he's making this figure eight up here. He's making this figure eight. Why? Because see, he's see the sixth step is when he takes off the flesh. Read, read where you were at in, in uh, Corinthians, where you, where you left off. That Yahweh may, all, may be all in all. Now, when he takes off his, I'm talking about Elohim, taking off that shape and form, that super incorporated shape and form, now he's in the Sabbath. Right. And now here, Yahweh may be all in all. See? And look, that, that has to be that way because, see, when you look on the migratory pattern, let's just draw a line, draw a line. Look on the migratory path. There's an opening there. Right. That's a sixth step. There's an opening there. That he's, you know, and, 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 and see, and Joshua, you know, went through, and all the people with it. That's the same way over here. Elohim's going through, but he's taking us with him. Right. Not only us, but the angels as well. He's taking everybody with him up in here, just like Joshua took everybody up in here. See, what is that scripture? Ezekiel 46 and 1. See, this is the original 92nd atom, or the hydrogen atom. It started off with him, and it has to end with him. Okay? Ezekiel 46 and 1. Mm -hmm. Thus saith Yah Yahweh, the gate of the inner court that looketh towards the east. Uh, see, look, what is the, what is the gate that, of the inner court that looketh toward the east? Isn't that the tabernacle? Because when the tabernacle was set up, it had to face east toward the rising sun. It was never any darkness in this holy place because, one, see, when the sunrise would happen, 
It would shine through the door. They, the candlestick was put out at 9 o'clock. And so, because by that time, the sunlight is in here. And then at 3 o'clock, that's when it was lit. And see, and it just was constant light here. Right. See, draw a line. It's the same way over here, the new earth state. And so now here, the, this gate, see, see, in principle, we'll look at this gate is going to be closed, but we... Shall be shut the six working days. For six working days. What working days? Six, six ages. Six ages, because that's how long Elohim is working. Right. Six ages. He's working six ages. The seventh age is the sabbatical age. There's no work done. Read. But on the Sabbath, it shall be open. Now, on the Sabbath, it shall be open so that he may enter in and rest. Enter into his, it will be open so that Elohim may enter into his rest. The Sabbath, the seventh age, that's right here. Go ahead. And in the day of the new moon now the new moon which is no moon because no. why because see the moon what does the moon point to the moon oh. points to cardinal ordinances there will be no cardinal ordinances in the new earth state there ain't gonna be none of this physical baptism circumcision ceremony there ain't gonna be none of this physical stuff that, no, there will be no new moon there mm -hmm. read it shall be open and it, it, it shall be open is that it and the prince shall enter by the way of the porch uh-huh of the gate without, and shall stand by the post of the gate. Mm -hmm. And the priest shall prepare his burnt offerings and his peace offerings. Mm, that's good enough. All right. Now we said the figure eight. Go to the textbook. It's in the section, the um, Ages and Dispensations, volume one. to show thyself approved unto Yahweh, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the dispensations and ages. The word of truth, 2 Timothy 2, 15, learn to correctly divide the ages and dispensations. Okay, that's what, it, that's what Dr. Kelly said. Learn to correctly divide the ages and dispensations. Here's the A is declaring the N from the beginning. And look, they're both, one, you see, one is naked and the other has clothes. Here, this is at the beginning of the ages. This is hidden in a mystery. But now, going through seven ages here, that's what this represents. This, he's appearing again in the front of the seven branch last stand, meaning seven ages are completed. He has seven stars in his hand, meaning he's going to sow seven new ages. And now he's fully clothed. Why? Because at this point, we are in him. And now the mystery is fully revealed unto us in him, who is the true sanctum of sanctorums. See? And then we in him will decide what will happen in the next seven ages. See? As Yahweh is eternal. There were sets of ages before this one. There will be sets of ages after this one. Okay? 
See? But he is, he is the original or the archetype pattern of the universe. He's the original 90-second atom of which everything sparks, springs from, it comes out of, and everything has to go back into. And it's him again. And he is that universal spirit pattern. See, of which the universal law of the spirit is operating within. See? And that's what you are. See, you are that. You are who you've been looking for. See? One of the aims says about the power latent in man. The power latent in man is simply you not knowing who your creator is. And then, you know, I hear people now make statements like, well, the Holy Spirit got to be put in you and all this kind of thing. That, it doesn't happen like that. Because, right. see, Yahweh doesn't have to jump from one thing to another as he's in all things. However, I'll say this. Everybody does not have the Holy Spirit. Because people say, hey, well, everybody got the Holy Spirit. No, that is not true. However, everybody does have the Spirit of Yahweh in them. Right. See, and the potential for the Holy Spirit is there in this sense. The veils right. have to be rent in twain. See, they have to be rent in twain. And then once they're rent in twain, then it's revealed to you what was up there in the first. See, the law of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit are one and the same. But once the veil is rent and it's shown to you what's really there, now that is the Holy Spirit. And when the veil is rent, that's those demons being cast out. Right. Because the Holy Spirit and the, and the Satanic Spirit cannot coexist in the same body. However, here's the mystery that a lot of people don't understand. The law of the Spirit and the Satanic Spirit can coexist in one body. In other words, see the difference. See, here's the problem. And people say this, that, well, Satan is sitting on your throne. That is such an erroneous statement. It's not true on two levels. One, who said this was your throne in the first place? Who said it was yours? I have never read nowhere where Yahweh gave up this throne for you. I ain't never read that nowhere. And two, Satan never sits on this throne, ever. He's on the veil. He's the angel that covered it. Now, he covers the veil. He covers, or rather, covers the throne, because if your body, soul, spirit, he covers it, you can't see what's up in here. If anything, you'll see a nice bright planet called Saturn with rings around it, and you'll think it's a neat thing. In the holy place, you see the moon, that's a bright thing, and you think it's a neat thing, if you never saw this. And Satan does use that. And Dr. Kinley does say, look, the law of the spirit is always ever-present, no matter what's going on with your consciousness. See, but once you come into the truth and the veil is rent, see, that's the kicking out of Satan. That's the revealing of the law of the Spirit in you. And that is the Holy Spirit. Once you recognize that which is in you. It, it's not a thing like, well, the Holy Spirit got to get in you. That is just, that sounds like Jehovah Witnesses. That's just not so, because the spirit of Yahweh is already in you. The, the thing is, these veils got to be rent in twain, and the flash of the Shekinah got to happen in your heart. What changed? Yahweh? Yahweh didn't change. You changed. Yahweh is always there. The law of the spirit and the Holy Spirit are one and the same. He didn't change. You did. That veil got to be rent. See, you got to see what's happening up in here. See? But again, you have to go back and look at Dr. Kinley's work. You know, I, I, I was saying it the other day in a class, that the first 55 pages in volume one is the very reason why Dr. Kinley has a PhD. He gave a dissertation in front of Fisk University, which is a historical black college and university. And they were so impressed. I'm talking about the faculty. They were so impressed. They said, sir, where did you go to school at? And he said, I'm a sixth grade dropout. <laughs> and he said, and they told him, I said, not anymore. But what you presented, this is, you know, this dissertation you presented is worthy of a PhD. And they gave him that. That's why he has a PhD. And then somebody want to come along, they don't want to believe what he wrote about the comparative exogenical analysis or the hydrogen atoms. Oh, that they don't mean nothing. Well, then, if you don't believe that, stop calling Henry Clifford Kelly a doctor. This is how stupid some people get after a while, you know, but that's okay. It's supposed to be that way. It's the end of the times. 
you know, and seeing now, you know, I don't worry about the world trying to deceive me because they can't deceive me no more. Right. See, once I get up, once, once I learned about Yahweh, Elohim, Yahshua, Lord God, Jesus Christ, that was obsolete. You can't come to me like that no more. Mm -hmm. You got to step your game up, adversary. You know, you can't come with this. You know, you got to come up, you know, you got to come better. <laughs> you got to come a little better than that. See? We want you to take the time and look at these things. Right. Our model is simply read, research, and rehearse. Those are the three R's that we, we practice here. See, that you can do. You have divine instructions for that. But the fourth R, that's revelation. That's Yahweh's department. Right. However, Yahweh, through his divine instructions, has allowed the man to come in, to have a class. Like, well, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, you can't come to class. Because he's going to say, well, there's nothing I can do. Well, then stay your ass at home. Don't do nothing then. And see if the, you get salvation like that. No, Dr. Kennedy said, come to class. Come to school. Come on time. Be on time every time. As much as you can. And, and listen, the world is, is in a situation today where you may not, we may not have steady classes like we can, you know. You know but you have technology and things and, you know, we'll, we'll get by. We'll get by somehow. Yahweh has never abandoned his people. Again, you know, we have ample record for that. All right, I'm starting to, to blather, I think. <laughs> Any questions, comments anybody want to make? I got a comment. Go ahead. You're reading a panoramic vision. Something came into my mind saying, it sounds like Dr. Kenny was being translated, you know, from, from the egotistical state, one with Yahweh, you know. Are Rob thinking about that? That's a translation from from the physical to spirit, you know, to uh, well, understanding what he says. Uh, I I felt the steps on him, you know. Mm -hmm. He was one with the universe. Yes, you know, that's my comment. He was translated. He was made to be an apostle, and he was translated. And, and his example and others in the scriptures to show that we too must be translated first in the spirit and then we will be translated in a new earth state. Oh, new wine, new wine, gotta have new skins. Right, right. The new wine and this old skin here, it, this old skin can't handle it. Right. You know, it'll make it burst. It just can't handle the journey. That's why the scripture says flesh and blood cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. See, there must be a translation, but Come to class, learn all that you can. You know, that's what Dr. Kennedy said. Learn all that you can, you know, and these charts here, because you're gonna need it. You're gonna need every molecule of it, you know, because the times will be bad. And even Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, you have not yet resisted the blood. You know, so let's, you know, just count on Yahweh, you know. To lead us and guide us, you know, that's that's all we can do at this right. point. And continue to learn more about him. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, the strength of thy salvation. That's what the scripture says. Okay, I'm gonna conclude. Thank you very much for tuning in today. We hope you were edified by the things that were said. As always, be safe, be healthy, but most of all, be in Yahshua the Messiah. Why? Because most truly is your only hope of glory. And with those few words, hallelujah.
in Florida. What town? Orlando. Orlando. Orlando, Florida. Right here, you know. Okay, so try to be there. Here's the information to get a hold of us. Also, you've got the chart book. We can make charts, anything that you want, you know. You gotta pay for it though. So uh, that's it. That's all stand be dismissed. I ask uh, my beautiful daughter to come up and give the doxology. They should be nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be reading the doxology from the last two verses of Jude. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise Elohim, our Savior, through Yahshua the Messiah, our Sovereign, belong glory and majesty, dominion and power, both before all time, now and ever. Let us all say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah.